Hi folks! So in this video I'm going to tell you about authentication, um, which is a really fundamental concept to cybersecurity. And we need to do authentication before we can reliably do make any decisions about what someone's allowed to do in a system. Uh, because authentication is basically how we know someone is who they say they are. Um, and so in this video, I'm going to give an overview of what authentication is, some factors of authentication, and what multi-factor authentication is, and some other important concepts, uh, which I'll also follow up with some short videos on some, some other topics. So in order to actually enforce anything in terms of cybersecurity, we need to basically establish who they are so we can make those decisions. So on one hand, we've got their identity, which is, you know, for example, who they say they are. And then we've got authentication, which is how we verify that they are who they say they are. So for example, uh, you might have your passport and that describes your identity. And if you're gonna use your passport as part of authentication, you know, you might hand it over to someone uh, and then they can then um, look at the photograph and decide whether you are who you say you are. So um, obviously passports also include uh, even more authentication um, features in newer passports, but you get the idea. Um, if we are offline and we're trying to prove our identity, often we'll do it like visually. So you look at a photograph, you might do it based on um, signatures. So you sign something and that proves that you are that person because you can sign it uh, using their signature, which is obviously fraught. And there's all sorts of problems with, with that in real life. Uh, you know, in, in the real world, you know, people can forge signatures and, and the rest of it. But, you know, if you wanted to apply those same concepts that worked offline for so many years to computers, well, it doesn't really translate very well because we can't use signatures um, because, well, once you've, once you've signed a, a document and given someone a copy of it, if it's a digital copy, it is trivial to copy that uh, and, and sign another document with that same ink signature. Um, and talking about electronic signatures outside the scope of this, of this video. Um, but there's some, some important security terminology is that we've got subjects. So those are the active entities within a system that's trying to, to do something to access an object. And you get objects, which are resources uh, such as a file. And so when a process accesses a file, the program is the subject and the file is the object. So the purpose of authentication is to, like, I guess the, the formal um, purpose of it is to bind an identity with a subject so that we can make the security decisions based on its identity. So we've got this subject within our system. It's actively trying to do something. We need to make sure that we've bound an identity with that subject so that it, throughout the life of that subject, we can use that information to make the security decisions. And so when a process tries to access a file, for example, um, on a, you know, on a, on a computer system, then we can look at what the identity is that's associated with that process. So for example, on Linux, it's UID, or on Windows, it's SID. Um, and then we can use that to make security decisions. And the, why, the reason we can do that is because, you know, they've already, the users have authenticated to that system. So, you know, broadly, it's fairly um, straightforward, but you, you get some information you analyze that and determine whether it um, matches what you're expecting. So for example, you ask them for the password, you check that the password's correct, and if it is, then, um, you know, happy days. So the idea of risk-based authentication is that the strength of the authentication that you put in place should be commensurate with the severity of the risk. So for example, if you're trying to protect some really valuable assets within your organization, you make sure that the, the um, level of authentication that you put in is strong enough to be able to provide um, you know, 
the, the level of assurance that you need in order to protect those, those assets. Um, and another advantage of using strong authentication is that it can provide accountability for actions. So for example, if someone does something, accesses files they're not supposed to access, for example, then if you have strongly authenticated them, you've used, you know, for example, like passwords and biometrics and one-time passwords and all the rest of it, then you can then quite confidently say, we know that it was you that did it because no one else has access to all this stuff. And there's no like, re you know, so that, that kind of accountability can um, be helpful to an organization, for example. Um, once you've been authenticated, then the, um, that identity and you know, authentic authentication that's taken place could persist um, indefinitely, um, like it is on most operating systems. Um, so for example, if you log into Linux or Windows or Mac or whatever, and um, you stay on that system, you can stay on there for as long as you like. Once those programs that you've started forever will be treated like you, they have your identity. Uh, and the security decisions that the operating system makes will be just like, are you allowed to do that? Okay, these programs are allowed to do it. Um, they might be rechecked after a certain amount of time. So for example, um, you know, you can configure an operating system to just log you out um, after a certain amount of time or a certain amount of inactivity. Um, and then you would need to re-log in, but also those processes that you already start would normally just continue to carry on with your privileges. Um, and it might stop you from starting new processes. Um, although obviously it's possible to create something that acts differently, but that's generally how it works. Um, or um, maybe it's that certain actions require um, you to enter your pa password again, for example. So, you, you know, if you're doing the right thing and running as a normal user and you try and do something that requires extra privilege, at that point, you would have to re-authenticate to say, are you sure you want to do something that's potentially dangerous? Um, then you, you enter your password and then say, okay, so you can do that then. Um, and um, I guess in terms of websites and the way the authentication works for them, um, often you will have um, certain websites like banks will take things more seriously. And so if you are inactive, you know, you've logged into your, your internet banking, but you've not done anything for a while, it will log you out. Um, and if you, even if you are on that system and then you try and transfer some money, it will get you to re-authenticate, um, you know, using a token, for example. Um, whereas something like social media, where they, the, you know, the, that security versus usability trade-off will be done differently. They might decide to basically let you stay logged in as long as you like on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, and they'll only prompt you for a password if you try and change your own password or something like that, for example. Um, so a really important concept is that there are different factors that you can use to verify a user's identity. So you can broadly categorize them into three kinds of things. And then there's, there's often there's other bits you can think of that aren't included in those first three. So I'll give you an example of that. But the three important ones that are usually um, you know, mentioned when we talk about factors of authentication, there's something the user knows, something the user has, and something the user is. Um, and so something that the user knows is something like a password or some other shared secret. Something that the user has is something like a smart card um, or, or a badge or an authentication token. Um, something that the user is can include you know, biometrics like fingerprints, retina scans. And then there's other things which include like where the user is could also factor into it. So if you're logging in from a specific like physical location in an office or online, for example, or from a specific IP address, that stuff can, um, can be used to also provide a level of assurance that they are who they say they are. So multi-factor authentication is where you use more than one of these things together. Um, so for example, you can combine a what you know, like a password with what you have, like a smart card or, or an authentication token. And um, the 
that it just makes it harder for an attacker. It makes it potentially significantly harder to. It means they need to have breached, um, you, you know, to have discovered your passwords, but also broken into your house and steal your um, authentication token, for example, which makes it a lot harder for an attacker. Um, so if you're using multi-factor authentication, or also known as two-factor authentication, if you're using two of them, uh, but you could use as many as you know you design the system to use. Usually two is the, what people aim for at the moment. Um, then that means that if something is compromised, it has less of an impact. Um, and just to give an example of this, so the European Payment Services Directive 2, um, requires two-factor authentication for online payments. So any online payments that happen within the EU should be using, um, you know, multi-factor authentication. So, um, so identity management is, I mean, an identity management system are systems that try and manage all this stuff. So you'll have a server that is, um, for example, helping to to implement authentication on your on your systems. Um, but some more like important um, decisions or design decisions around how you do your authentication is that you can have identity that's strongly linked to an individual. So for example, your bank account, in order to start a bank account, you need to provide uh, like a lot of documentation to prove you, you are who you say you are. You, you, know, you, need, you might need to provide your passport or whatever else to the bank to, to prove your identity to them. And so that's tightly linked. Um, anything to do with like taxes um, and um, like income and everything, for example, that will need to be like tightly linked to pers personal identification. So the authentication there needs to be really strong. Uh, the opposite end of that is where you've got privacy by design, where you are providing privacy by allowing someone to be anonymous. You might allow them to have their identity on the system, but that identity is not tied to a specific individual. Um, and then um, also there's some design decisions around that is you might have a locally unique um, identifier. So for example, on a Linux system, the, the actual identity used, and there's, I recorded a separate video all about Linux um, users, uh, user accounts and everything, but that is um, basically just a number. So it's a, a, an integer number that is, for normal users, use, usually starts at the number 1000. So like your UID, user ID, is 1000, um, which is simple and straightforward, but you could hop on another Linux system and I might be a, a different user could have 1000 as their UID. So it's, you know, it's locally unique, but not like globally. Um, or you could have like a really long random string as your, the way that you um, have your identity and that's how Windows works with their SIDs. And so, you know, there's, wouldn't be, uh, or there shouldn't be someone else in the world that has the same um, SID as you. So even on a separate Windows system, that what they use to um, for their identity is kind of unique, kind of globally, um, and you know part of it is actually can be tied to specific domains, and uh, and we'll cover that in in another topic. Um, so a website websites often use people's email addresses um, as IDs, um, so so your unique identifier when you log into uh, a website is your email address. And there are some things to consider around this. Is like what happens if someone else ends up with your email address? Um, usually, it wouldn't really happen. But say, for example, you deleted your email account with Gmail. Can someone else sign up with that account? Um, or on a Linux system, if you um, delete a user account and create a new user, it's possible that someone else on that same machine will end up with the same UID. And then if you've not been careful about permissions, they might end up being able to access those files that had previously been shared with the other user. Uh, and on Windows, that's not so much of a, of a problem. You might have the opposite problem where you delete a user and you create a new user with the same name and you can't get access to those same files. Um, but yeah, it's just some things to consider. So I recorded a separate video about password security. So I'll just briefly say that passwords are um, something that the user knows. 
Um, <clears throat> you should make sure that users are educated to choose good passwords and protect them. So actually take care of them properly and to manage their own passwords correctly. Um, nowadays, the, um, the guidance around passwords is that if you're going to specify password rules, it's better to require a length rather than complexity rules. So, you know, if you have a really long password, that can be just as good as a password that has uh, um, special characters or numbers in it, for example. So if you're going to require someone to meet a specific um, like password rules, you might want to go for length rather than, you know, including different kind of characters. Either way, you're essentially increasing the key size or the search size of what you would need to brute force or guess. Um, so, you know, they both add, add something, but generally it might be someone to, easier to, for someone to remember a long sequence of words than to remember, remember a long sequence of numbers and special characters. Um, and if you get the same kind of like um, security benefit from it, then you, know, you might want to let them do the thing that works better for humans. Um, password aging and expiring is now discouraged, so you shouldn't be expiring passwords sooner than you need to. Uh, essentially, um, you should just let people keep passwords um, for, for a while. There's no rush in forcing people to change passwords too often. Um, you should avoid using password hints um, or knowledge-based authentication. So like, what was your pet's name, for example, is a bad way to, um, to for example, if like, you forgot your password and, and you know someone's pet's name. It's not an improvement because actually a lot of that information is really easy to get on social media nowadays or just through like basic social engineering. So it's, it's better not to use password hints or knowledge-based authentication, um, you know, where you can get away with not doing that. Um, you should allow people to paste passwords into web forms because people use password managers, which are effective ways of dealing with um, the problem of having millions of passwords that you need to manage. Um, and you should give people the option to look at their password when they're typing it. Uh, I'm going to record a separate um, video about this, but um, another factor of authentication is something that you have, and that includes smart cards, so cards that you can use to tap in, um, and things like authentication tokens, um, like this, or um, like this, where they you know provides a number that you have a set amount of time to to use to log into your account and that number on there will, will change um, so i'll record a separate video um, there's biometrics so that's things like your fingerprint um, your, your retinas uh, and those sorts of things uh, and that's something that you something that you are that's intrinsically part of you that you can kind of measure uh, and i'll record a short video describing some of the pros and cons around biometrics um, and then there's the another closely um, aligned topic is around network based authentication, uh, which we'll cover um, another week. Oh, we'll, we'll come back to this topic in, in some detail. Um, but essentially the idea is that you have like centralized or distributed servers that you can use to authenticate users against. Um, and there's a number of different ways that you can that you can do that. Um, so that rather than having all your passwords stored on every single machine, you have a specific server that helps to manage um, different protocols that are used to manage uh, authentication. That includes um, LDAP, um, NIS, Kerberos, um, Radius, and Active Directory. Um, we'll talk about that another time. So, you know, you have an identity management system that can help you to link permissions. Um, so, so basically, the, the important job they do is the identity and authentication. Uh, and that's closely tied to the topic of access controls and authorization, which we'll cover in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but just say that some of these systems kind of fairly tightly include some privilege allocation and things as part of the way they're doing authentication. So that kind of like, can mean that once you've logged in, you get some kind of level of authorization. It might be that you're given those privileges directly or through some kind of abstractions like groups or roles, but this is something that we'll cover in, um, 
a lot of detail in, on a separate occasion. So in conclusion, um, authentication can be based on various factors. We can use multi-factor authentication, which is where we check multiple things um, or multiple factors in order to verify someone's um, identity. Uh, passwords are the most common, what you know. One-time passwords and authentication tokens are what you have. Biometrics are what you are, um, or an example of what you are. And you know we've also touched on um, authentication in distributed systems.